Welcome to the Iyun Podcast, an in-depth look at Haredi society, Israel, and the Jewish people. I am your host, Ari Koretsky, and I invite you to join us as we confront the challenges, joys, and possibilities of Torah-centered living in an evolving world. The Iyun Podcast. Think again. Welcome back to the Iyun Podcast as we continue our conversation about Haredim and the army. One of the concerns, perhaps arguments, against army conscription for the Haredi population has been that, at the end of the day, ultimately, the army is hierarchical in nature, and there is a very rigid chain of command. And whether one's immediate commander himself is a Haredi person or someone with such sensibilities, climb the ladder enough, and you will find someone who is most definitely not Haredi, not observant at all, possibly even hostile to religious observance. And so the guidelines and the decisions handed down from quote-unquote on high may not be in conformity with halacha or Jewish values writ large. Rabbi Shlomo Brody has written an incredible book which was released only after October 7th, but in fact, it had been in preparation long before. It's called Ethics of Our Fighters, which of course is a playful riff on ethics of our fathers, Pirkei Avos. But it is really a fantastic and instructive, very accessible and readable book, traveling the history of Israel's and really pre-state conflicts through the modern era, dealing with all of, or at least many of the thorny issues that have been adjudicated over time. And I believe that in this particular moment, this is a book that any thinking Torah Jew should read and consider in terms of its impact on the question of chain of command, orders, and halachic observance, not in the ritual sense, but in the broader conceptual sense when it comes to army service. And this is precisely the topic of my conversation today with Rabbi Shlomo Brody, founder and director of Amatai and author of Ethics of Our Fighters. We are here with Rabbi Shlomo Brody, the founder and director of Amatai, which deals with making ethical choices from a Jewish perspective in the healthcare realm. He's also done quite a few other uh, positions, including as a Rebbe in a yeshiva and working for the Tikva Institute and many other things. But in today's context, Rabbi Brody is coming to us as the author of the fabulous, relatively new book called Ethics of Our Fighters, which appeared on the scene in a very, very relevant and important moment. And uh, we'll get there and discuss everything having to do with that book and more. But first of all, Rabbi Shlomo Brody, how are you? It's great to be here with you. Thank you so much. Amazing. Now, Rabbi Brody and I uh, actually go back close to 30 years. I don't want to give away the exact year, but uh, we overlapped some time in, in our youth in yeshiva in Israel. And I've sort of followed his career uh, from afar a bit over the years. But I, I have to say that this book at this moment really does seem like a crowning achievement. And, and I want to ask you, before we get into the meat of the matter, tell me a little bit about the evolution of this book, the genesis of this book. When and how did it come about? And was it just sort of, I don't want to use the word luck because that would be really, uh, you know, sort of capitalizing on a, on a terrible, terrible moment. But it just happened to be sort of coincidence that it came out at this time. How did it all come together? Yeah, I mean, it is pretty wild at the timing of how the book came out. I was actually working on it for some time. Uh, the area of my interest, my great interest, even when I was a Rebbe in Yeshiva Sakotel, but in other institutions as well, is to try to think about how halacha applies to modern day dilemmas. Of course, in my day job with Amatai, so we think a lot about issues of end of life care and medical ethics and halacha and all those realms. But I've always been curious about how halacha could be speak to other questions and other dilemmas that we face today. And over the last several years, living in Israel and thinking about these questions, you know, I started writing about it in the Conference of Jerusalem Post and teaching about it other places. And a few years ago, I said, okay, I'm going to try to turn this into a, a safer to make it a proper book. Uh, little did I know, of course, that the book would come out, you know, six weeks into a war 
uh, and it'll be all too relevant, uh, very painfully relevant. Uh, I've had five, four nephews who've been serving in the army, and uh, my oldest is entering the army now. Uh, we've had 25 shivas related to October 7th in the army in Modin alone where I live. So it's been a very painful experience in many ways, but uh, also somewhat you know, rewarding in the sense that I feel that I was able to put out something now which can help people give a little bit of the cave, a little bit of the tools of thinking about Torah perspective on some of these deep issues that we're facing. And ultimately, that's the goal of the Safe Fair, is to give people a perspective rooted in Torah and Jewish values on how to think about these issues. It's, uh, you know, I, I have to say, I've been going through the book and I'm almost finished, not quite, but uh, it, it is really fascinating to read about how many dilemmas and challenges and questions, uh, you know, of, ethical and moral decision-making do tend to repeat themselves. I just, you know, read a, a chapter now about uh, 1982 and Lebanon, and I, I could have been reading about 2024 in Gaza. It was amazing. And, you know, the, the concept of guerrilla warfare and, and urban fighting and all of those things, these are not, you know, brand new questions that uh, thinkers are grappling with today. These are, questions that have, you know, repeated themselves throughout Israel's history. And I imagine that as the writer of this book, you've kind of been having a re repeating deja vu throughout the war, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. It's been painful deja vu in many ways because some of the dilemmas I wrote about that happened in 82, uh, we haven't really solved. Not just the dilemmas, but the actual military questions. I mean, we're talking about the same southern Lebanon. We're talking about the same phenomenon coming out of Gaza. And I talked about in other chapters. And so in that respect, it's quite painful. Uh, but on the other hand, it is good to know that we've thought about these issues and we've developed a framework for thinking about these issues. And what I want to try to show in the book is that we actually have the tools to think about how to apply these teaching and these principles in our current situation, in our current very complex situation. And one of the most depressing things I find about following the war in general, looking at both Israeli media, but particularly the foreign media, is the lack of intelligent tools that people are bringing to the conversation. I mean, the conversation is really being driven by social media, by images on Instagram uh, or TikTok. Or, I mean, you don't get more superficial than that. And it's just terrible that we have this deep ethical intellectual tradition, both in our own Basora, but also in the broader Western world. And it's barely being invoked. And so part of what we have to do as Jews is bring to the table something of a sophisticated thinking about these issues. Just one or two more questions on the book itself, on the process and so forth. It, what I found interesting is that you've kind of, you, you employed a chronological approach, kind of surveying Israel's conflicts over time, for the most part, with, I guess, a, an exception or two. Uh, and yet each theater, each battle, each period seems to express a different moral or thematic aspect of the overall question. How did you sort of stumble upon that way of laying out the book? And did you, again, sort of just luck into the fact that, hey, every one of these, you know, each one of these periods represented or highlighted a different dimension, or was that prospectively intentional? Well, that was a, a theme, you know, a way of framing the book that sort of developed as I was writing it. I didn't know that it would develop this way. I think it makes the book much more interesting, though, in the fact that I try to tell also a little bit of the history of Israel and the history of sort of the Jewish grappling with the new ethical dilemmas that we didn't have to think about for many centuries. And really starting with World War I, before and as well, but starting with World War I and beyond, and starting with the Zionism. We got to think about these issues. And as I started to read about like where these debates first start to emerge, it started to come to me, okay, I think you can tell a little bit of a history story here. And actually a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Daniel Gordis, who wrote a very good book on the history of Israel. So he said to me, you know, Shlomo, you sort of wrote like a history of Israel through the history of ethical dilemmas in war. Uh, and uh, that was great that he noticed that as well. And certainly, I, I think that that's something that comes through in the, in the book. And, and ultimately, one of the things I want to do here is to make this accessible to people. And part of the problem with much philosophical literature 
and the Havdil, but in its own way, some rabbinic literature, is that it's just written for a certain elite intellectual that can understand certain terms and phrases. And when you can discuss issues through stories, through narratives, through case examples, it's much more interesting and it's much more relevant to people. And hopefully that will allow people to learn from our history and actually apply it to the current day. As I certainly concur, the, the writing style is, is almost conversational, breezy. I feel like I'm sitting there with you and you know, in your in your living room or like we are right now, just kind of having a back and forth. And uh, it's been very, very accessible, as you note. How did you get interested in this particular topic? Because you mentioned that, you know, you're interested in dilemmas, ethical dilemmas, and how our Jewish wisdom can inform a wide variety of those topics. Uh, you know, you wrote this before October 20, October 7th. So obviously this wasn't spurred by that calamitous day. Um, so why military ethics specifically, as opposed to, again, your day job is healthcare ethics, and there are many other areas of ethics that could be uh, explicated as well. Yeah, well, before October 7th, we had wars in 2014, 2008, 2006, and we've had smaller things going on since then as well. So these issues are always relevant uh, here in Israel. Uh, they did, there was an incident where uh, I spent a lot of time in my graduate work in uh, Bar-Ilan University, my PhD work. There was a lot of effort thinking about issues of religion and state as a whole. And um, and part of that period, I invited a very prominent speaker, non-religious, who spoke to a group of my students about how he helped frame the IDF's code of ethics. And at one point, uh, one of the students asked him, like, Professor, what does Judaism have to say about this topic? And the professor responded, Judaism, military ethics, the only thing he has to teach is the laws of Asia Sephastoa, of taking a captive woman in the midst of war, and I'm not interested in anything like that. And as you can imagine, the room sort of got, you know, went up in arms was in sort of fury, telling yeshiva students that all Judaism has to teach about this topic is something which no one in the room, was, of course, was interested in. And that was an incident amongst others that spurred me to say, you know, we really need a book on this topic that will take some of the deep rabbinic teachings on these issues, halachic teachings on these issues, and put in conversation with some of the broader ethical and legal uh, terminology and discourse that goes on the Western world. And I could believe, actually, in many ways that, as far as I can tell, a book like this hadn't been written before. I was really trying to put the conversation together between these great discourses. And so I set out to try to write that, and uh, please, God will help people. Now, you certainly drew on a rich and wide body of writings on uh, secular ethics from a military perspective, you quote often as Michael Walzer, he's probably the most often quoted uh, military ethical philosopher. Often you're disagreeing with him, um, but you're quoting him in general and and many others. Um, but we, what were the primary sources that you could employ from a Jewish perspective? Because obviously the uh, Jewish world was uh, an exilic people for 2000 or so years, approximately a uh, little bit under, I guess. And, you know, we were not in a sovereign position. We were not in a situation of the ability to exercise power or to stand up a military or engage in any of these kinds of, uh, kinds of dilemmas. Obviously the most we were doing was maybe <laughs> fighting back against a pogrom or not fighting back against the pogrom, but where was the, uh, the, the primary sources from a Jewish perspective that actually spoke to this? Did you have to go all the way back, you know, just drawn straight from Tanakh? Or where where did you look uh, when you began this conversation? Well, it was one of the big dilemmas and questions, which is where are we going to get these sources from? I mean, if you think about, let's say, my work in medical ethics with Amatai. So we have precedents in medieval time period to discuss these issues. Of course, we have to figure out how do you you know, take a principle or a statement from the 14th century at the Shulchan Aruch, 16th century, and apply it to modern medicine. But you've got something to work with, right? You have Simonim and Shulchan Aruch that talk about this. You don't have that when it comes to war. You have a little bit in the Rambam, and even there, there's a lot more that could have been said. And so that was one of the dilemmas I was thinking about. But the truth is, over the last 100 years, Jews have been living in areas where wars have been fought, including where Jews have been fighting in these wars sometimes in foreign wars, right? sometimes European battles or American wars, whatever it might be. And 
it turns out that uh, Gedolei Yisrael in different ways have been writing different forms of essays, maimarim, shutim, whatever it might be, on different topics. And no one really systematically put together something that's a really like a, you know, a thought on how to write a book of cover all the issues. But over the last century, you see that these gedolim did write profound ideas. But they weren't in conversation with a broader ethical discourse, so sort of using rabbinic terminology to apply to different issues that came up sort of an ad hoc basis. And so that was really where I started from, right? Of course, is to work on the, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, as we say, and to go sort of, you know, figure by figure in many ways and say, okay, what's been written about various topics over the, cent- you know, the century? And Baruch Hashem, you know, we, we've had some very deep, profound writings uh, over the last century. And they, these great Dolman figures, quoted various passages in the Rambam or, you know, Psukim in Tanakh or sometimes in Amari Chazal. And that was certainly very helpful. And pulling that all together, I think actually we have a rich, rich literature. Um, one of the interesting discoveries I found, though, is that sometimes the great rabbis and others were speaking in cases where you don't find their statements in like shooting and like proper halachic journals but you find them in like public statements that they make in the midst of the, the disagreements between 36 and 39 over fighting terror with terror, right? You know, these great writings from Rav Herzog and Rav Uziel and others, which aren't necessarily going to be found in their shutin, but are actually out there and they're very deep and profound thoughts. And uh, that took a lot of work, of course, to find those statements. But once you have them, you see, oh, you know, we've got a lot here to work with. At risk of... Uh sounding a bit anachronistic, did you find that most of the statements and the responses and so forth, you know, on these topics from the last hundred years, you know, once we've been sort of back in the land and the pre-state period and then ultimately with the formation of the state itself, were most of those coming from Rabbanim who were more what we today call kind of Dati Lumi, you know, in that world, again, I know that the the divides were not quite as distinct and and sharp as they are today. Certainly, um, it was a little bit more complicated than that. You know, in a period when you know, someone like Rav Yashov could be on the on the state court and things of that nature. But nonetheless, did you find that most of the writings and things were coming from those decisors because primarily they were the ones more engaged in this conversation philosophically, ideologically, or do you find even Rabbanim who are, you know? in today's world, considered accepted voices among the more right-wing elements, do they also, in any cases, have uh, contributions that they made? Yeah, I think most of the contributions come from people who are rebundant, who are dealing with the questions coming from the army or from the government. Um, so figures like Rav Koch, of course, before the state was founded, he dies in 1935, and then various chief rabbis, Rav Herzog, Rav Ziel, uh, Rav Shal Yisraeli, Rav Merkaz Rav Yeshiva, Rav Shlomo Goren, of course, is the first chief rabbi. Those are certainly the postkim, the decisors who had the biggest influence because I think they're most engaged in these issues. You do find a little bit of sometimes some figures like the Tzitz Eliezer, or the Ezra Waldenberg. But people don't know, Rav Eliezer Waldenberg in the 50s wrote a whole big fat sefer called Hilcho Medina. Or Hilchus Medina, right? Depending on how you want to say it, right? In which he discusses some of these issues. Um, so, you know, the lines, as you mentioned, weren't as clear back then as they were uh, or they seem to be today. That's rather unfortunate, you know, because I'm sure Rabbi Yashiv or Shlomo Zalman would have had some very interesting things to say, to put it mildly, about, you know, some of these issues that we had to deal with. Um, but, but yes, but that's where the phenomenon comes to mostly. You know, occasionally you have a little bit of writing a psakim that comes from Rav Shlomo Zalman or from Rav Yashiv when it came to the issue of like Shabbat and, and warfare. And you see that, so you know, some people that sort of went between both worlds, particularly in the 73 one, the Kippur War, there's some interesting questions that they were asked and they addressed. I mean, we're by Aaron are, Lichtenstein, famous, who was very close to Shlomo Zalman, right? And I know that correct. you were a Talmud of Ravaran. So, you know, I imagine there must have been discourse there. Ravaran, one of the pioneers of Hezder. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the lines, I mean, I think about at some point, Rav Neria. So Rav Neria was a town, you know, is thought, thought of as the father of the religious Zionist yeshiva, right? 
you know, the Av of the Kippot God. But, you know, he's a Talmud of Moshe Feinstein's brother. He learned the same places in yeshivas in Europe. You know, a lot of people here learned the same yeshivas in Europe. People knew each other. Uh, people were married to, uh, you know, various family members. So, you know, it's always interesting to me what would have a various post said of one thing or another. I mean, one of the interesting stories I tell is about the fight over the partition plans before the state is founded. And one of the figures who really re- influenced Rav Herzog in order to accept the partition plan, even though it meant giving up, right, or giving up some territorial aspirations, was Ophaya Moser Brzezinski, right, in Lithuania, who writes him a letter on this issue because he wrote to him. And so all those questions, I think, are a little bit anachronistic. And I don't know, please, God, we'll get back to the point where the full Torah community will be engaged with these issues. So in diving to the heart of the matter and, and the way the IDF actually functions and makes its core ethical decisions, there is a, an, an ethical guide for the IDF, right? There is a document uh, that exists out there. I don't know if it's publicly accessible, but tell me a little bit about what currently governs IDF ethical choices. And I imagine there may be a kind of an ivory tower, a theoretical, and then, of course, the the moment to moment, situationally based uh, realities on the ground. But what is the current actual state of affairs in terms of how decisions are made of an ethical nature in the IDF? So there's a combination of two factors. One is something which is known as the IDF Code of Ethics. There are actually two versions of it. There's some differences between them, uh, written by uh, different sets of philosophers, but but not ivory tower philosophers. People that were writing in conversation with generals and with strategists and other people. And as with many things in Israel, these are people that themselves have served in the you know in the army. So this wasn't the type of thing which is just such an ivory tower. Okay, let's sit down at Starbucks and write some code of ethics, right? So um, you know that's one thing that certainly guides Tzahal. Um, but it's a pretty ge- general document, it's a generic document. It doesn't get too many specifics, but lays out some principles. This is in contrast, by the way, to the American Army or the British Army, who have very detailed 600, 700 page like book of law, how they understand law, international military law, and how it applies to their armies. Um, Israel hasn't done that. I'm clear to me exactly why. I think there are a few different reasons. One of which is, though, that uh, Israel has some questions about how to apply international law, and that may be the same way that other countries do, but we'll get back to that later on. And then, but besides, of course, these code of ethics, you have within the army a legal wing right, of lawyers and others who are advising the army about the legality under international law of certain behavior, which the primary focus on actually is beyond ethics is more than anything to make sure that when the inevitable form of lawfare, as they call it today, the inevitable attempt to bring soldiers or generals goes to international courts, the army can say, no, no, we had these actions reviewed and approved by various lawyers. We'll prove this and say this is legal under international law, which is quite significant. Not that it seems to matter all that much when it comes to the ICJ, ICC. (laughs) Well, there's no doubt the ICC and ICJ uh, are very problematic institutions for a lot of reasons. But one of the primary reasons why they're problematic is they're not meant to officiate in situations where the local government has its own judiciary that deals with these situations. And so one of the great scandals of the fact that there's an attempt, for example, to bring Netanyahu and the Garland and others to uh, to court is that it's not supposed to apply in situations by their own charter rules when the local judiciary is well equipped to deal with such issues. In fact, We've had multiple prime ministers and presidents in court in Israel. And uh, we have also, though, an army, you know, court system and whatnot. And it's a very sophisticated system. So, um, it, but but long term, it might be helpful. It might still be helpful to have that system. And I think those are the two factors that sort of govern um, the way the IDF behaves in practice. So I want to get into the issue of Haredim specifically, because in my conversations over the last number of months on this topic, one of the primary contentions or concerns that is raised from a contemporary Haredi perspective is 
issues of what I'll call chain of command or military hierarchy and military directives. The sense being that this is a community and not to say that this to the exclusion of any other community, but this is certainly the self-identification of this community is such that it is a community of punctilious halachic observance, that one does not lift one's finger, one's hand, one's anything without recourse to Shulchan Aruch or the, uh, whatever is represented by that term. And that the military, at the end of the day, of course you can keep Shabbos on some level, you can observe Kashrut on some level, in fact, on a very high level, on a Haredi-oriented basis, and many other such accommodations. However, at the end of the day, the chain of command is such that the decisions being made from the generals on down are not decisions that are being made in, in consultation with halachic sources, with Jewish sources. And therefore, even though the lowly soldier, of course, the foot soldier out there in Gaza is not the one who is, you know, in, in the conversation about these uh, determinations, and he's ultimately just carrying out, you know, so in that one moment, yes, it might be a pikuach nefesh situation for him in that localized moment. But ultimately, the project of being in the army altogether means submitting oneself and the entire community to this chain of command that is not governed by halakhic principles or even by Jewish values principles uh, as we might articulate them. And, you know, you've noted that the IDF guide of ethics is not particularly, um, is not necessarily integrating those principles. You mentioned this anecdote with the, uh, the author or one contributor who spoke to your class who didn't even know that Judaism would have anything intelligent or meaningful to say on the subject. So this is really a core objection, uh, sometimes an un- or under-articulated objection, but I think in some ways lies at the heart uh, of the Haredi uh, opposition towards army service. How do you sort of navigate that particular question and respond to the Haredi individual who authentically wants to live their lives in accordance with these principles? Yeah, no, it's a wonderful question, a very important one, and a very deep one. I, you know, I think, Rabbi Koretz, we should separate out a few different issues. There's there's one issue that relates to sort of following what we'll call in terms of ritual, right? Making sure Shabbat and Kashrut and other things of that nature are observed. You know, Baruch Hashem, the situation in the army today is quite advanced when it comes to observing uh, these issues, uh, which, of course, are critical. Now, there's sometimes judgment calls that have to be made, right? It's particularly when it comes to Shabbat, when it comes to war times, whatever it might be. But there is a real sophisticated system. This really goes to the credit of Rav Gorin and Ben Gurion, who together insisted that there's going to have to be some form of setup made. And the system's improved vastly over the last uh, 70 plus years to the point where I think many, you know, has there in the king, people in Yeshiva has there, they Torah care very much about halacha. Uh, feel that they're keeping halacha, they're keeping Shabbos, they're keeping, you know, kashrut and whatnot, and having zmane tefillah, whatever else it might be, uh, when they're serving in the army. Um, so, you know, that issue, of course, there's always room for improvement, and there are, there are issues that come up, but but that issue, I think, is certainly addressable. There's a second issue, which is just, you know, whose command are you under, right? And uh, who's making decisions, and it's in a couple of different ways. I mean, you could write... A book, right? It says that army boots, army boots, right? Should be put on first on the right foot, then the left foot, and then you tie the left foot, right? <laughs> you can update Shulchan Aruch for army wear, but I don't think that's the real issue that's at hand here. Um, there's a much larger issue, of course, about um, who's making decisions and is this in a halachic type of framework? And here again, you know, you have a whole community of B'nai Torah in the Dati Lubi world who care very much about this. And you live comfortably with you know, the fact that their decisions are being made, which they think are in consonance with halachic values. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't decisions that are made that you think are wrong. Of course, there are going to be decisions made that are wrong. But part of the argument I try to make in the book is that um, there is a range of values which are very important that get taken when we go to war, when we choose to go to war in the first place, and then how we fight war as well. And as long as someone is keeping in mind of those values, those halachic values, 
those are reasonable, halakhically acceptable decisions, even if they didn't intend them necessarily to be under halakha. Of course, we like to have more and more religious influence in a positive way on the army. And the best way to do that is to increase the number of people who care about religion and Torah who are actually in the army. But you know, let's also keep in mind that there is this base core requirement of a Muhammad mitzvah. And a Muhammad mitzvah, right? It's not clear where all these Purim come from. And so, you know, I'm sure others have discussed whether, you know, Shevet Levi and all this and that, and I'm sure others can discuss this as well. But at its core, it's just really hard to understand why it is that um, a group of people committed to Torah don't see a Torah obligation to defend the country when that seems to be a mitzvah. And that's why I have the notion of Muhammad mitzvah. So if you start from that premise, then I think you'll be able to figure out and solve some of the other problems. But of course, it's been a 75-year already struggle on this issue about thinking about the influence of Torah on decisions that go on in the state and the way the army fights. And I think the more and more that we get more people committed to Torah involved in these decisions, uh, the better the situation will be. I want to read you a paragraph uh, from your book. I hope you'll recognize it. Uh, it's from page 236. And, and it just, I was actually reading it uh, over Shabbos myself. We're speaking here on a Sunday. Uh, in terms of a real-time conversation. And uh, it struck me, and I actually folded it to say, I got I to gotta remember this for when we when we talk, because in some ways it may capture the heart of some of the Haredi concern. And I certainly hear where you're coming from, that, you know, okay, uh, you know, there's a, there, we're not starting from a, uh, of a zero position. We're starting from a new, not from a neutral position. There's positive reason a person should be doing this. And so, you know, figure it out. But I think for many Haredi for whom, for better, for worse, and one could argue, I think, fairly cogently for worse, that is not the default position. That is just not the starting position. And so there needs to be sort of a convincing narrative that not only we'll figure it out, but, you know, this can really make sense for you as a Torah observant person. So this paragraph comes at the end of a chapter where you're, you're touching on a concept of land for peace and these major questions, as you referenced earlier. And the final pa uh, paragraph on page 236, these are all strategic questions, not religious ones, and they must be answered at each time and place. This discretionary assessment should be made by elected leaders. They, in turn, should be guided by military and diplomatic experts while remaining sensitive to the sentiments of the people as dictated by democratic values. In such a context, there's nothing wrong with a distinguished rabbi or a celebrated writer, thoughtful columnist, or some other public intellectual expressing their opinion on these topics, but their authority stems from their wisdom, not their stature as legal decisors. These are not decisions of the absolutes in which we make unambiguous declarations of obligatory and prohibited. In both war and peace, discretionary choices need to be made in a world of uncertainty. Now, I can imagine that paragraph being uncomfortable for someone coming or used to coming from a very call it black and white, but very uh, halakhically oriented world where, what do you mean? How could we be equating the Rav and the public intellectual, the Jerusalem Post columnist, you know, no offense, and the, you know, and the great Posek, you know, sitting in his Dalit Amos, Shel Halacha, wherever that may be. Shouldn't everything come under some rubric of quote unquote Halacha, even if that is a somewhat elastic definition? Right. So, uh, you know, that's that paragraph. It's a good paragraph uh, that you go there. It is a, after a development of, you know, of a full chapter of a certain idea there. Yes, and I, I acknowledge I'm pulling a little bit out of context. Uh, that is a bit unfair, but nonetheless. Right. right. But nonetheless, I understand the point. It's a fair question. Uh, listen, there is a big, uh, there are a few different assumptions I'm making in the writing there. First of all, one of the assumptions is that um, strategic decisions are matters of uncertainties. And so it's not always easy to know what is right or wrong to do when, again, the overall goal is, of course, to protect our people and to secure our land and to, and those are different types of values. Sometimes those values might not be, you know, they might collide with each other, of course, that's part of the debate. Um, but uh, but the, when in the world of uncertainty, you're gonna have to make decisions which aren't always so easy to know what's right or wrong. And let me give you an analogy, actually, which is very relevant to our times, which I think will help make the point. Is it a good idea to trade uh, prisoners, murderers, terrorists, 
and to release them in order to bring home our captives. Okay, so this is a legitimate question which you can invoke many halachic sources about, right? There's a Mishnah on Gittin, and you know, there's various all, all sorts of factors that have come up, and there's the Red Baz, and there's various chuvo they can talk about. We have actually a lot of halachic literature which may or may not be relevant on this issue. And at the end of the day, you're going to end up having, which we do have, a really serious machloket poskim on this issue. And so then the question becomes is, okay, well, what are we, how, where is the black and white here? So you end up having a machloket. So uh, what exactly then have you solved by saying that there's a das Torah here when we all know that the vast majority of issues in practice, when you're dealing with matters of uncertainty, and you're doing matters of probability and certain types of strategic calculations, which are not scientific, which are not mathematical, right? Which are not absolutes. Right? So you're going to end up with a machloket. How much do you have here in Das Torah in terms of actually being a decisive answer? And so part of my argument, and this is uh, not my, my own argument, I'm talking here, Rav Salvation discusses this, or Vad Yosef discusses this in the, in the chapter that I'm talking about, um, makes an argument which says that, listen, there is a great value of postkim to bring those values to the table, to help us think through what are these values that we need to be keeping in mind. That's a huge, huge contribution to give the framework. But I don't think we can expect all the postkim to also be experts in military and diplomatic matters. And so that being the case, we're going to have to make decisions, uh, which people might disagree with because I think it's a bad strategic decision, but it doesn't make it halakhically illegitimate. And of course, this comes up under many different circumstances. I mean, you could argue and say there's a Muhammad mitzvah right now to fight against Hezbollah in the Lebanon. After all, it's a war of self-defense. So you can invoke those terms, but how come many in Israel, including many religious people, are not that interested in going to war right now? And the answer might be because for strategic reasons, it might be wiser not to go to a full-blown war, even though you can make a lachic argument why this is a Muhammad mitzvah and it has to be done. And so you know, part of the argument I try to develop in the book is that halacha can give us a very, very, very big contribution of giving us a framework of values that we need to keep in mind. And then reasonable people, starting with an understanding of the metzias, right, of understanding what is it that we're dealing with on a strategic and military and diplomatic level, can disagree about how to apply those principles in different ways. And that's perfectly legitimate. And I think that many B'day Torah already serve in the army, you know, live with a certain amount of comfort in knowing that there is reasonable room for disagreement amongst uh, postkim on various issues, even though they might feel very strongly that something is right or wrong uh, in this circumstance. I mean, those that oppose the Gaza disengagement, the Hitnat in 2005, but nonetheless served in the army, felt very, very conflicted by this situation. And yet they continue to serve in the army. So, you know, uh, I'm not saying that it's always going to be a comfortable situation that's always come out in harmony. You no, know, there's going to be a bit of a clash, a bit of tension. But in many ways, that tension is actually a beneficial tension because you take these values and bring them to the table. And I think that will make us a much stronger state. And so, you know, I can see, though, why, if we take that statement out of context, that will make people feel a bit uncomfortable. But in the broader context, I certainly believe that Judaism and Halakha have a lot to contribute to the public discourse. I do wonder if if being in a role of a non-combatant would potentially mitigate some of those challenges for, for a, let's say, a Haredi soldier um, or any soldier, you know, concerned about these kinds of issues when you're not the one, you know, pulling the, the children out of the shul in, in, you know, in Gush Katif. It's a little bit, you know, maybe more removed and a little bit less... Um, of a clash of values. But I will note that even, you know, back in 05 and, and earlier times when we're looking at Oslo and so forth, there there always have been a stream or a strain of Rabbonim who have who have advocated uh, for conscientious objection. So when does that come into the picture, right? If you, uh, presumably this is because they believe firmly that this is forbidden by Jewish law. And so do, do you, do you lend credence to that category? Do you believe that there should be such a possibility? You know, if, if, if somebody comes and says, look, the cognitive dissonance here is just too great. I cannot in good conscience serve in the army and execute this particular role in these particular orders because it simply clashes with 
Halacha, could you imagine a class of Haredim being in the army and yet turning to their Rabbanim and at certain moments in time saying, Ad Khan? Right. A great question. So let's just take, separate two issues. One issue with regard to land for peace, I just want to remind everyone that many of the Haredi parties, led by various Dolem, were not opposed to Oslo, right? Certainly. And, Certainly, right? So yeah. in other words, uh, the whole land, notion of land for peace is a good example of this where it's not always so clear where it's all going to fall out. The divide isn't necessarily religious Zionist versus Haredi and whatnot. And I, I think many divides actually don't fall along those lines. And that's where life actually gets much more interesting when you see where the complexity of the issues. In terms of the question of conscientious objection, this is a very, very important issue. And it goes both ways. I mean, we had this before October 7th, where there's a big threat, more coming from the Israeli progressives or left, we're saying we're not going to serve in this type of uh, government. We're not going to serve in this type of army. And so it can go a lot. We're not going to serve in the West Bank, right? You get those types of claims as well over the years. That's a very, very important power that people should have of conscientious objection. I believe in the concept of raising a black flag, so to speak, as they say in Israel, in military terms. Well, sometimes, you know, if you're, that can come up in different ways. It come up in an operation where your commander might say to you, okay, you know, kill all these kindergarten kids. You're not supposed to do that, right? You're supposed to say, I refuse to do that. And I'll go to jail. I wave the black flag. It won't do that. And there are times when people will find that they have a conscious objection to certain types of things. And the army being a people's army has to be sensitive and try to how to, you know, avoid some of those types of conflicts. And that certainly can come up. I think one of the issues that has come up with concerns of Haredi integration into the army, will there be a situation where, I don't know, you have a, whole unit who says we won't fight because our Rebbe, you know, uh, I don't know, the Bellas are Rebbe, whatever it might be, the Gary Rebbe, right, whatever it might be, has said it's us or for us to do X, Y, and Z. And so that's caused a little bit of concern. I'm wondering how much of a concern that is. I think actually the more and more that people get integrated into the army and they see, understand the level of deliberation that goes on, the more comfortable they ha- they are that there's a reason and rationale which is reasonable cogent in the types of decisions that are being made. Uh, so I, I don't know. You know, I know people are afraid of this. Well, I think people are afraid of this on the Chiloni side than anything. Um, but, you know, I think that a lot of times Chilonim are afraid of that team and the army for bad reasons. And so, you know, we still have a lot of way to go, of under, long way to go still to understanding each other better in this country. In your idealized vision, would you imagine like a, a based in sitting in the situation room you know, in the Hamal and in, in the Kiria, you know, I don't know, Rav Dov Lando and Rav Eliezer Mulamed sitting together, you know, and pick your third, uh, maybe a Hasidic Rebbe, sitting together and, you know, informing or influencing some of the strategic decisions with the up-to-date, minute-by-minute strategic assessments, uh, obviously informed by by Torah, by Halacha, from their perspective. Is that an idealized version vision or is that just not even a realistic uh, even even in the most, you know, fantastical scenario, that could never be the way that things unfold. Uh, you know, I, I don't always think in terms of ideals in this respect, so I'm not great at playing the game, so I speak of ideals. But, you know, I do think in terms of trying to create a situation where wherever, it doesn't matter who's sitting in the room, what matters more than anything is what values they're bringing to the table. And uh, if we have people who have been imbued with certain values, and the types I just try to describe in the safer and try to describe in the book, the things are, are important to bring to the table on these issues, but also have wisdom when it comes to the strategic issues and the diplomatic issues and military questions that come up here. I, those, I think that's the type of ideal situation where you have people thinking in those terms. That, I think, is many, much more the ideal. You know, do I expect all Dolem to also be able to be in the room and have that level of expertise as well? I'm not sure. Right? There certainly are, you know, I think major Talmud Chachamim that you see already in the religious Zionist world who have significant army experience and understand sort of what's going on, uh, but also know the Torah world well and and sort of have a real appreciation of Torah values for sure. Uh, but does that mean that there you have to be the ones making the decisions all times? I'm not so sure. Who are the Rabbonim today? Not the, you know, not Rav Gorin and and so forth, but those alive today who are thinking and writing most about these issues. I know Rev. Ramon has been very involved. I know of Malamed, um, 
I guess on the Haredi side, the only one that I could think of, uh, and he's kind of been adopted by by the more modern world anyway, is Rav Asher Weiss. Are yeah. there any others um, that are the great Rabbanim that are maybe underappreciated, under-recognized, who are doing a lot in this space? Well, first of all, there's a Rabbanut Tzvayit, right? There's an army rabbinate. Now, primarily, they're dealing with ritual issues, right? In terms of Kashrus and Minyanim and Shabbos. Unfortunately, they've been dealing with a lot of what's called Ziyu Chalalim, right? Identifying bodies right yep. now. I mean, that's really very Avodah Sakoidesh that they've really been involved with right now. Uh, tremendous, tremendous service. But certainly some people in that area, you know, think about these issues. Uh, I think, you know, Rav, um, uh, Rav Ariel from Ramat Gan, for example, is written it's very, Rav Yaakov Ariel, very big Tamachacham, very big God in the Zionist world, has written a lot about this issue. Uh, Rav Yuval Sherlo from now Yeshiva in uh, Tel Aviv has written quite extensively about it. He actually has a new Sefer on Jewish ethics, which touch upon a number of military issues as well. Um, certainly, you know, Rav Mon, Rav Melamed, uh, Rav Reim Cohen, Niel, um, you know, but I, I'd say that many of the religious Zionist Rosh Yeshiva in one form or another are thinking about these issues and writing about them in one form uh, or speaking about them. But, you know, we don't have the situation right now where I think Torah has really been asked to be brought into the conversation about these questions, which is unfortunate. But it's also partly because the Torah world hasn't written material that can be digested and understood in broader legal and ethical terms. So, you know, it sort of goes both ways. You want to have a situation where people in the ethical world in Israel, the world of philosophers and ethicists and army people will say, okay, well, what does Jews have to offer to the topic? But you can't speak in the language of the Rambam and the Sefer Achinoch and the Ksuz, right? In other words, it doesn't work that way in a way that they'll be able to digest that and integrate that into their thinking. Uh, so I, I know I'm hopeful. My Sefer is now coming out in Hebrew, Mirz Hashem, the next couple of months. And uh, I'm hopeful that there will be a first step in sort of integrating those different dialogues. That's fantastic. Do you think that the army itself as an institution would be receptive to these increasing contributions? Or as you said, some of the Chilim are afraid of this. Are, do they not want this? It, it, a lot of it depends on how it's presented. When it's presented as a matter of halacha that has to be imposed, Chilim don't like it. When it's a matter of Jewish wisdom that can enlighten the broader ways we live, people are much more receptive to it. And this is true about many things right, in Israeli society. I mean, if you think about it, the law that is most influenced by halacha in Israel is the law relating to the terminally ill, treatment of the terminally ill, which was written under the guidance of Professor Rabbi Professor Avram Steinberg, one of the great bioethicists, right? Halachic Poskin, editor of the Encyclopedia Tabadit, who created a 59 person committee who brought together all sorts of different people from different ways of life, including Gedolim and doctors and philosophers and healthcare professionals and social workers. And they created a document which is infused with Jewish wisdom and is in conformity with halacha, but was accepted. You know, with you know some horrors, of course, but accepted by the Knesset and accepted by the broader population. So I think that's a very interesting model or situation where if you bring wisdom to the table, it can be integrated into some of our thinking. Just the kind of in closing, what are some of the other major dilemmas when we talk about this bifurcation between you know day to day ritual observance, which again to me is much less interesting because I just think it's it's much easier to solve and. It's much more, it is kind of clear cut. You know, you, you daven chakras, you don't daven chakras. I mean, you know, okay, we make the time for them. We don't make, the, like, that's. it's not all that complicated. Uh, it's important, of course, but it's, it's not that complicated. Um, but on the on the broader philosophical conceptual levels, what are some of these other major dilemmas? You know, in the book, you cite the great uh, debate between Rav Gorin and Rav Yisraeli about letting people out on, quote unquote, the fourth side and, and keeping a side open for non-combatants and potentially combatants as well to flee. And this has, of course, become a huge topic in, you know, the Gaza corridor and allowing people to flee each city as they, you know, take action in that next uh, theater of battle. And, uh, you know, the em employment of face facial recognition to capture the terrorists. But, of course, the uh, the 
inevitable fact that terrorists will also escape and all of these kinds of decisions. Are there other such major overarching dilemmas that halacha or Jewish wisdom could and should speak to that fall into this kind of broader ideological category? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the goal of the book is to try to lay out some of these issues and say, what does halacha have to contribute to it? Broadly speaking, the major questions of ethics of war are when to go to war in the first place, and then how to fight war, and in particular about how you uh, deal with the issue of who you kill and how you kill those people. Um, those are major, major issues, which we're feeling in a very acute way today. I'm going to give you a very simple example which is not so simple. Should Israel attack Iran? Right? We're sort of at war already with Hezbollah. Should Israel attack Iran? Now, you could say that we've already been attacked by them, which is sort of true, but you could also still say, okay, that sort of ended. You know, we had that one Saturday night, a little bit of fireworks in the sky, and we've moved on, okay? <laughs> it's a little bit of a superficial way of thinking about it, but there is a broader question of, should we do what was known in ethical literature as a preventative war? The not it's not preemptive. They're not imminently attacking us. It doesn't seem that way. But should we take the battle to them before they get, to say, a nuclear bomb? Well, it turns out that the Gemara already has a discussion about this. And Rishon seem to have different opinions about this. It's sort of hidden in various Mepharshim and Rishon, whatever it might be. And if you tease out, you actually have a very sophisticated framework of thinking about these dilemmas. And so I think that's actually one of the biggest dilemmas we have to face right now. I think the biggest question we have to ask after October 7th is, why don't we attack them first? Meaning maybe there's intelligence failures and not knowing, but we knew that Hamas is a threat. What were we waiting for? Why don't we attack Hezbollah? Why are we waiting so many years for them to build up and whatnot? And you know, I think Halakh has a very interesting framework for thinking about these issues. Admittedly, I don't think that you'll walk away from the safe air or looking at this Allah sources inside and say, oh, Allah has a bona fide answer to this question. And this is not, you know, a type of issue of how to warm up, you know, schnitzel on Shabbos. Right? It doesn't come out. And by the way, on that issue as well, there's a bachel again, right? But, but certainly on these issues, I don't think you have clear-cut sources that will tell us for sure, that largely because of the strategic uncertainty. But I do think halacha can contribute a lot to thinking about the framework of these questions in a way in which Rabbanim can contribute to the broader discourse in which I think also we'll learn and be able to converse with others who don't necessarily think in halachic terms, but we're very happy to hear about Jewish wisdom on these topics. You know, Rabbi Kretzky, one of the most interesting things for me since publishing the book, of course, it's only in English now, but soon be Hebrew, but in English, is that it's gotten some interest in non-Jewish circles as well. I mean, I've written for non-Jewish publications, I've spoken on podcasts, there are various rabbis who have connections to the U.S. Army who have given the book to sort of high-level commanders and generals in the army. And By the way, just to quick. interrupt you, because I think I mentioned this to you, I had over, because uh, I live in Silver Spring, near somewhat near the Pentagon, had over a Shabbos guest who was a very high-ranking officer stationed in the Pentagon, and he saw it lying around. He said, I need to borrow that next. So if, on your behalf, I'll tell him to buy it instead of borrow it. But <laughs> I'll send him a copy. Right now. <laughs> More than anything, I'd like to see. I think it would be Kiddush Hashem and, and just helpful to the world to show that the Judaism is something to contribute to the broader conversation and that the broader world can learn from the Jewish and Israeli experience. I mean, that's a mamash kiddush Hashem in my mind. I want to just close by, with a little bit of editorializing, and I, and I wonder if you would concur with my analysis, although it's a little bit outside the exact uh, scope of, of what you've written about, but sort of on a meta level. You know, it seems to me that the Haredi world, in some sense, is waiting for a kind of pristine, almost laboratory condition in which the ideals of Torah and the real world can converge, you know, looking for, as Ramosha writes about, you know, Milchavas Mitzvah is when you have an Urim Batumim, and, you know, there's sort of a Sanhedrin or a great Bezdin that's there, whereas the Dati Lumi world is more, uh, in a sense, willing to actualize halacha in a kind of a messier call it real politic reality um and and i think that may be a divide that um cuts across multiple issues but the army being uh, maybe the most salient of them that do we how do we react in a situation in which we are not in perfect laboratory based measures conditions is the torah designed 
for such a situation? Or do we sit back and say, no, we're waiting for the period when that will be the case. We're waiting for the time when we will be in King David's army again, when the Rabbanim will be synonymous with the generals. Or do we say, no, that's just simply not an option. We have a Torah that is a Torah schayim, and we need to institutionalize it uh, or instantiate it in our current reality. And yes, it's not going to be perfect, but this is what we need to do given the the reality of the moment. And it has to do with you know how much human action versus divine action. I think it's a much deeper, almost meta-philosophical divide between these sort of two ways of thinking about Judaism. I'm wondering if you concur with that analysis or would, would uh, flavor it in any way. There's definitely something to what you're saying. Uh, I do think that the Datilumi world, as a matter of principle, decided that as a halakhic obligation to get involved from the get-go in the founding of the state and the fighting for the state, uh, which came at a certain cost and price, uh, but was very important. We felt that this is what God wanted from us. This is what halakhi demands for, from us. And I think the Haredi world is looking for, I think parts of it are looking right now to find ways to get integrated. There are certain parts of the Haredi world that are very much not interested in that. And the Haredi world is a big world, right? Let's, I mean, let's just also, it's one of those things that frustrates me to no end. It's like you think that Pelik Yerushalmi, you know, is the same as, I don't know, you know, all sorts of people living in Beit Shemesh, and you think like it's all, you know, like, look at Beit Shemesh itself, right? This is a diverse city in its own right. So you have to always keep that in mind. But there are definitely parts of the Haredi world that I think would like to get involved and integrate. And part of the thing that they're going to have to accept is that it's not going to be ideal conditions. Right? It's not like David Hamelis, you know, army. And uh, we have to figure out how to nonetheless uh, get integrated and be a part of this conversation. You know, I really feel that uh, this is a moment of truth. Only respect that we really realize now. We thought it was coming 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when we felt like, okay, we're really going to need more Haredim involved. But the issues have become very acute very quickly. And it's really a painful situation, but we really need more people involved in the army. We need more, more people working. I mean, no one's barely talked about the financial cost right now to this war. What we're going to have to be spending on Miluim and uh, equipment. It's, it's tremendous. So there's all different ways in which we need the Haredi community to be much more involved in broader Israeli society. And it's in my hope and feel of that the Sefer will provide a little bit of model of saying, listen, Rabbi Yisai, we have something to contribute. B'nai Torah has something to contribute. We can take these values and bring them to the table and we'll be part of that conversation. And uh, you too can maintain your lifestyle while still being engaged in broader Israeli military and economic society. I do think a huge part of the shift needs to be uh, a mental shift from kind of a passive or reactive posture to a proactive uh, contributing posture because it, it can't be a defensive community anymore when you have over a million souls uh, and people of great and diverse talents. Um, and I think that's a large part of what, you know, this podcast is arguing or exploring the the possibilities and the contours of that uh, ability to contribute. So Rabbi Shlomo Brody, thank you so much for teasing out some of these incredibly important and difficult questions. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much.